Lead me. Hey, well, listen, I am so excited that you are with us here today. We're in a series that's called Lead Me, and we're looking at what it looks like to be led by Jesus. Not just in like this blind faith way that says, you know, just do as you're told, don't ask any questions, but in this truly genuine way that wants to be led by Jesus. And it's really a series that's birthed out of our mission statement here at Crossroads. And the statement is this, is that we exist to lead people to discover Jesus and follow him fully. We want more than anything else for people to say to discover who Jesus is, understand that he died for their sins and the entire world, and then that he receives, uh, that, that we then receive that offer of grace and forgiveness that he gives us by calling him Lord and Savior, that that's what we want more than anything. But once that happens, once we've discovered who Jesus is, we must step across the line of faith and then say, yeah, I'm going to follow you fully. We must learn to give our lives up to him. And what we said is that by following someone, really, when you follow someone, you're saying, hey, lead me. Just, just please lead me, which is why choosing the right leader is so important. Week one, we actually discussed that. And we said that Jesus, the reason that we want Jesus to lead us in the first place is because ultimately um, the leader that we choose will determine the direction that we go. That, that's why. Th- th- this is especially important when it comes to our spiritual direction. We need to make sure that we choose a leader that's leading us to life and not towards death. But after we choose the leader, the next thing we have to do is be able to know that leader's voice. We have to be so attuned to their voice that we don't get lost in the world of other voices. Which in week two we said that who we listen to shapes what we say, what we say, what we think, what we say, and what we do. That who we listen to shapes all of those things. Jesus' voice is the only voice we need because only he will tell us where we should be going. And then last week, week three, we looked at choosing Jesus' voice as a choice. That we have to make that choice. And by choosing him, we actually are choosing to live. Uh, We said last week that, that, that where we are led tells us where we will head. I know English teachers everywhere don't like that, but it makes sense, right? Where you are led, uh, where we are led tells us where we're headed, where we're headed to. And and we were honest, though, about this. And we said that being led by Jesus won't always be easy, but it will always bring us life. So if you've missed any of those messages, guys, don't worry. Don't worry. I've got you covered. No worries. You, you, can, you can always go back to our website or you can get the free Crossroads Grace app. You can check all of them out there. Chat host, do me a favor. Place that, the sermon series link in the, in the chat right now and also where they can get that app. That would be so awesome. Uh, and, and so for today, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the final thing that we need to understand as we're led by Jesus. And, and to set that up, let me just kind of tell you a little bit about my family. We, we call, my family call it Team Hunt, okay? So, so when COVID hit, All the gyms closed. That's a big problem for me. I love to work out. It's part of my daily routine. And so sadly, I didn't have an awesome gym like my friend Jay. So I had to get creative. And instead of using the gym closure for a reason to sit around and get lazy, I decided to make up my own workouts. So I walk about three to four miles every day and I do a workout circuit along the way. Sometimes I'll use resista bands or I'll use different things like that. But most of the time, it's just body weight exercises. Push-ups, dips off the curb, crunches, planks, lunges, squats. A couple times I had my eight-year-old son kind of go stiff as a board, and then I turned him on his side, and I would do bicep curls with him. I know, the counseling will be terrible, I get it. But, but I just did different exercises every block or so that I would go. Uh, but since I'm helping to Zoom school my son and daughter, Anison and Easton, any other Zoom school parents out there, give me a high five. Loving you guys out there. Uh, listen, I wanted to make sure that they had some exercise too. So... Twice a week, I would have them run a mile for time. (laughs) 
Now, I can already sense some of those eyes rolling, some giggles happening. You're saying to yourself, man, I'm glad that is not my dad right now. But as a family, Sheree and I decided that exercise is a really important habit to instill in our kids from an early age. We want their entire bodies to be in shape, not just their gaming thumbs. <laughs> so Sheree and I, we would also actually have them do the walk workout with us, as I kind of talked about before. But, but I started to get frustrated. I started to get frustrated because when the kids were doing it, they were kind of not doing the exercises full. They were kind of doing it half-heartedly. Again, I can hear your laughter through the screen. Easy, okay? But, but, Sheree and I, but Sheree one day, she calmly said to me as I was grumbling and getting a little bent out of shape, she says, Brian, we have to ask them to do it. But if they don't do it, we need to leave the decision up to them. They're only hurting themselves if they don't do it, but we can only tell them that it's good. We can't force it on them. Why is she cute and wise at the same time? I have no idea, but, but she's right. So from that day forward, we left it up to them, whether they wanted to get better or whether they wanted to not get better. And, and as I've said throughout this series, leadership is one of the hardest things to do, but it is one of the most important things, especially if you want to be a great leader. Because to be great, it takes work and sacrifice and willingness to constantly grow to be effective. And, and one way you can tell a great leader from like a good leader is that great leaders invite you into a greater story than they're currently in. Great leaders inspire you by how they live and how they think and how they believe. And it compels you to want to have that same thing in your life. But, but a great leader, listen, a great leader will never force you to do it. Leaders that force people, force their ways on people, those are called dictators. You might have heard some dictators. Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Mao Zedong. I mean, these were all dictators that forced their leadership on their people. And this type of leadership will create an unwilling compliance, but it will never induce willing commitment. Now, the true sign of a great leader is having people that desire to follow because they want to, not because they have to. Each week, we've re reiterated that point, that, that being led by Jesus is a choice. We, have a, we need to choose the leader. We need to choose to listen. We need to choose to live. And then finally, this week, we're given the opportunity to choose one last thing, and that is to choose to follow. If you don't believe in Jesus here today, or you're not sure about this whole God thing, I just want to let you know I'm so pumped that you're with us. Thanks for being here. I, I, I totally mean it. Thanks for trusting us, just even to tune in. And I hope that you know that we don't allow perfect people at our church. We are a come-as-you-are church that has people jacked up from the floor up, starting with the guy you're listening to right now. So feel free. Look around. It'd be a part of whatever you'd like to do, whatever you feel comfortable with. This church was designed for you. So please let us know however we can help you. But as we come to this idea of following Jesus, I would say that most of us, and maybe even some of us, bristle at that idea. Because maybe you grew up in a tradition where you went to church on Sunday and that was the extent of your God interaction for the week. And maybe you grew up going to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. Anybody in that camp? Hey, amen. Hello. Maybe you grew up going to a Christian high school and you said, eh, that's enough for me. It's all I need. Maybe you don't think God is real, so why would you follow something you can't see? Maybe it's none of those things. You have a totally different story. But regardless, all of us come into this conversation with some sort of feeling towards God. Feelings that will either encourage us or discourage our willingness to follow him and have him lead us. But I want us to see, at least for one more week, to see why Jesus is the greatest leader and why we should choose him to lead us. And to do that, I want us to actually look at a familiar passage in the Bible in a new way. So if you have your Bibles with you, or maybe your Crossroads Grace apps with you, would you turn to Psalm chapter 23? Psalm chapter 23 in your Bible or your Crossroads Grace app. Um, in, in preparation for this, this message, I actually read a, read a bunch of books, but one of them was a book by Philip Keller, which may be really helpful for you too. So uh, chat hosts, if you would, put the link to that book right now in the chat log. You guys could check that out when you want to. Um, but if you're not familiar with your Bible, or, or maybe you are familiar with your Bible, you might have heard of these books called Psalms. And Psalms is a fantastic book. It's, it, it's, it's kind of fun, too, because if you have your Bible with you and you want to grab it, if you just like take it and put your thumbs halfway through and you open it up, halfway through the Bible, you're probably going to run into Psalms, or, or at least be pretty close with it. Give it a try. Go for it. Um, but, but more than just a fun party trick uh, to show your friends, the, the book of Psalms has some great poetic times. They have some penetrating words, like some of the most penetrating words in all the Bible are found in Psalms. There's 150 of them. 
150 Psalms, but one guy authored 73 of them, and his name was David. And David, man, that guy was fantastically interesting. He was a complex dude. But here's just a quick highlight of his life to kind of get to know David. He was the youngest of seven brothers. Um, he was a shepherd by trade. When he was young, a, a priest by the name of Samuel came to David's house, and he selected him as the next king of Israel out of all of his older brothers. <laughs> and he grew to fame by killing a nine-foot-tall giant named Goliath. He was a warrior. He was victorious in nearly every battle he fought. He was so successful that the king got jealous of him, tried to kill him, but failed. He was an anointed king at one point, and he was a king, and he was known as a man after God's own heart. But he wasn't perfect. Actually, uh, slept with a married woman and got her pregnant, uh, and then uh, devised a plan to have the woman's husband killed in battle, and then he married the woman to cover up the pregnancy. Yeah, that's just a quick look at his life. But you can easily see that his life was filled with drama and intrigue. But in Psalms, we get a chance to see the entirety of his life. ...and his reflection on his life. There are poetic moments at times... ...but then there's some really raw times. In fact, in, in some of the Psalms... ...you see David yell at God at the beginning... ...like, Aah! and then at the end he's like praising God. <laughs> and the reason I love Psalms... ...is because I'm that same way with God a lot of the time too. I get frustrated, I get angry with him... ...I ask him what's going on... ...and so in one moment I'm praising him... ...and the next moment I'm frustrated with him. And, and for that reason, man, I love David. I, I think I could get along with him. But, but here in Psalm 23, we get to see David reflect on his shepherd roots. Uh, he brings back the imagery of his childhood to describe what following God looks like. And, and as we open this up, it's, uh, it's as though we kind of turn the page on modern times and we peer back on the fields he used to tend when, when it was his flocks. So I'm, I'm, going to, um, I'm going to read out of Psalm 23, but I'm going to be out of the ESV translation today. Uh, so if you're normally, I read out of the NIV. I'll get to that in a second. But Psalm 23, I just want to read out of the ESV, just so you know. So Psalm chapter 23, start in verse 1, and it says this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. David begins by reminding us about the importance of God being our shepherd. A couple of weeks ago, we learned uh, that a shepherd and his sheep have this really amazing tight bond. Uh, the sheep will only respond to the shepherd's voice because the shepherd has earned their trust and devotion. So, so maybe Jesus was borrowing some of David's language here when he spoke about shepherds and sheep back in John 10, which we read a few weeks ago. Because here we see how David describes God as a good shepherd that leaves us complete and, and not wanting anything. And it's, it's under the leadership of this shepherd of God that the rest of this whole chapter plays out. Look at verses 2 through 3. It says that he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. So as, as we think about why we'd want to choose to follow God in our life... David points, uh, kind of paints this vivid description of the result of being led by the great shepherd. Uh, not that we should ask like, hey, what's in it for me, God, when it comes to him? But, but I do think it's awesome that God actually shows us the fruit of being a follower of his. He, he's not like your buddy that, that, that gets you to come help him move and says like, oh man, hey, trust me, bro. Dude, it's, I'm going to make it totally worth your while if you come and help me. And so you say yes, and then you show up there, and there's like two liter bottles of Mr. Pibb and some stale donuts from Save Mart, right? God's not like your cheap buddy. God lets us know that the results of following him, he, he knows, he actually tells us what it's going to look like. Right here, Psalm 23. We get to see what, what, that, that if we allow God to lead us, what is, not only what is he going to lead us to, but also what he's going to lead us from. He starts off by saying, hey, you're going to have some green pastures, the life that we lead right now is full of dead grass, pain, suffering, anger, hurt, you name it. It's all dead grass. But God says, no, no, no. If you follow me, I'm going to lead you to green pastures. How about still waters, he says. Isn't it true that most of, the, most of our life is stormy waters? Especially right now, this COVID time is crazy. But God says, no, no, no. If you follow me, I'm going to give you still waters. He says, I'm going to also restore your soul. Whether we realize it or not, our soul is getting beat up on a daily basis by the junk it's getting fed. It, 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 it eats away at us with one sinful thought and action and desire at a time. But God says, I don't want that for you. I want to restore your soul. I don't want to destroy it. And then the last thing he says is, hey, I've got some righteousness for you. 
in a world full of lies and deception and corruption, it can be easy to think, well, that's the only thing that's out there right now. But God says, time out. No, no, no. There's more. There's, there's righteousness that only I can bring, and I'm going to actually show you the path that you can walk on to find it. But, but not only is God honest about the things, the good things that are going to come, but he's also very clear about what he'll do when things get hard. That's where we go to verse 4, one of the most famous verses in all the Bible. It says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And I'm not sure if you're like me, but again, if you're a Christian, maybe you've done this. If you're not, it may not apply to you. But, but if you're a Christian, sometimes you go on autopilot when you read the scripture, don't you? I mean, I've read this psalm like a bunch of times before. It's super easy to do. But this time when I was preparing for this, I just decided I'm going to read it slower. I'm going to chew on the words a little bit more. And when I did that, something jumped off the page at me. And they're the first two words that we read. Before he talks about the valley of the shadow of death, David says, even though. Even though. He doesn't say, even if, as if there was a chance that it might not happen. No, 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 no. He says, even though. Meaning that this is going to happen. God knows that we are going to go through the valley. The valley is a coming. And for some of us, man, the valley is right now. The valley of heartbreak and betrayal and job loss and infertility and divorce and addiction and doubt. God says, even though you will go in it, I'll lead you through it. And David says that the good shepherd will lead us through with some very specific things. He mentions two things, if you noticed it. He mentions the rod and the staff. Let me explain what both of these are briefly. Uh, the rod, uh, the rod is actually what a, a shepherd has with him at all times. Uh, one shepherd that I read actually said that it's, it's considered his owner's right arm. Let's just think of it as the modern day conceal and carry permit kind of situation going on here. And often the rod was carved out of a root that they found. It was a little shorter than the staff that we'll talk about here in a second. It had a little more weight in the head than the handle so they could throw it a certain way. But it was a symbol of strength and power. And, 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 the, and the authority of the shepherd was, was felt in that rod in, in, when any a serious situation happened. It was used to protect the shepherd but also the sheep from any danger. But the rod was also used to correct and redirect wayward sheep where they, back where they needed to be. That's the rod. But the staff, on the other hand, is something that you might be more familiar with. The, the staff is kind of what we kind of think of shepherd. It's what we think of it. Long stick, maybe with a, a crook at the end, maybe like a little curve at the end of it. And it, it, was, it was used for various things by the shepherd while they were tending their flocks. Sometimes the shepherds would just kind of lean against it and uh, watch their sheep go by. Sometimes he, he would use it to kind of guide the sheep from danger. Sometimes he might even like pull a sheep in a little bit closer and, and walk alongside them like a leash, knowing that it needed a little more attention. Without question, the, the staff, by contrast to the rod, was known for comfort. But, but both were critical for the shepherd in his toolkit. Both the rod and the staff were needed to keep the flock safe and in line and also comforted. So again, we have to remember that sheep are skittish. They're low on trust. And so for a sheep to trust the shepherd, they must have learned to embrace both the discipline and the comfort. But this may seem a little odd to have this contrast of a rod and a staff aligned with a conversation about the valleys in our life. Wouldn't it make more sense just to have the staff to guide us out of the valley? Isn't comfort what we need in the valley? Perhaps. But, but as the good shepherd knows, sometimes we're in the valley out of our own doing. I'll tell you a story. When I was uh, in high school, my best friend Rob and I, we did everything together. And, and one time, uh, I was spending the night at his house and we decided we wanted to go sledding. Uh, not just sledding anywhere, though. We decided we wanted to go sledding at a local ski resort about an hour away. And that we were going to do it at night when no one was around. That's right, super fun, really illegal. Kids don't try this at home, but we had a blast doing it. So what we would do is that we took his dad's truck and we would drive the truck to the top. One of us would get out, we would sled to the bottom while the other one drove to the bottom. We would swap spots, drive to the top and switch over and over and over. 
What have, we were having a blast, having a super blast. But what happens is, is that we got to the end and we decided to have one more run. You know it's bad when you do one more run. Everyone knows that you never do one more run. It's the worst thing you could ever do in your life. Never do one more run. We decided, one more run. So we decided, we took the truck, we were going back to the top. And when we went to the top, we were going on a side road and we went on the wrong side road. We quickly learned that. We decided we needed to back around and we needed to try to get on the right road to get back to the top. Well, it was a really, really tight. There was trees on both sides. It was snow packed. So my best friend was trying to turn in super, super slow motion to get us around. But about halfway, we were perpendicular on the road. The next thing we know, we weren't going anywhere. We were stuck. Not going to happen. I get out of the truck. We both get out. We look in the back side of the truck. And wouldn't you know that this full-size Chevy truck had high-centered on a tree stump. There was no way we are going to get out. We tried everything. We put dirt underneath it. We put snow underneath it. It wasn't working. We were going to either die by no one finding us, or if our parents found us, we definitely were going to be dead. Sorry, Mom, if you're finding out about this right now. But so what I said is, I'm like, Rob, you get in that, you get in that truck. And, and in a second, I'm going to tell you to hit it. And when you hit it, we're going to get out of here. He says, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. Just get in the truck. This is what we're going to do. So I go around to the back side of the truck. I put the bumper on the back of my shoulders. I squat down and I lift up the entire truck just enough so that he's able to drive off. And we got out of there scot-free. Till now, because now our parents know. Now, what does this have to do with anything you probably say? See, here's the deal. Sometimes we're in the valley because we're in a mess and high-centered our life on the tree root of sin. And the only thing that will get us out is the rod. We need the discipline of the rod to, to realign us back to God. Let us get back on the right path so he can lead us out of the valley. There is comfort in the staff and the rod. And God uses both to guide us through the valley to his freedom. But on the other side of that valley is also one of the coolest scenes in scripture. Go back with me to Psalm 23. Look in verse 5. It says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is a very important moment when deciding whether or not to have God, uh, follow God or not. Because beyond God's goodness and his help through hard times, what we just read here is that he is also just. This is a critical aspect, to, especially in the world that we live in today. Critical. Knowing that God is a God of justice brings us great comfort to know that all the jacked up stuff that we see in the world around us will one day have to answer the King of Kings and Lord of Lords gets me all kinds of giddy and excited. E even just this week in Wisconsin and Kenosha and all the terrible things that are happening and have happened and you're wondering what's going on, all that hard stuff. We just know right now what it tells us that one day all those enemies, all my enemies, the ones that had hurt me, disgraced me, ridiculed me, judged me, abused me, all of those enemies will have to not only watch me eat at the table of God himself, but he will also, they will also have to see him bless me, anoint me, that God will bless the righteous. That should get somebody somewhere getting up and having an amen somewhere around this country, around the world. That God is one day going to make things right. And there will be a banquet, there will be a spread, there will be a table, and there will be a blessing to prove it. And when that day comes, we see David finish this psalm by almost saying, y'all, here's what the menu is going to be like at the banquet of all banquets. He says, look what they're going to serve. He says, they're going to serve some goodness. You see, no longer will we have to settle for anything that's not good because the only thing that will be there is goodness. He says there's going to be mercy there. That we no longer will have to be afflicted and under the oppression of this world. That there will be mercy from God himself. And he says that we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We won't have to be in this pit stop called earth. We won't have to be in this pit stop called, uh, called minimal life. That we will have eternal life with him. I can't wait for that day. I can't wait for all things to be good. I can't wait to, have, to, have, to sit in the mercy of God. I can't wait to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I can't wait. But the only way that happens is if I follow. It only happens when we choose to want Jesus to lead us. 
But here's the thing that just rocked me when I was reading this again. Again, I told you, I kind of chewed on this a little bit more. And what rocked me was that we have to know, we have the key, the key to Psalm 23 is this. We have to understand the vantage point of the author. So often we read this. It's like a fairy tale story where David is floating above and he's narrating everything that he sees. But in reality, he's a sheep. He's the one in the valley. He's the one being led. He is us. We are the ones that are in need of the good shepherd. We need the rod. We need the staff. We are the ones that want the green pasture, the mercy, the righteousness, and the banquet table. And all those things we look at and say, yes, yes, that's what I want. Sign me up. Yet time and time again, we choose dead grass, rough waters, a restless soul, selfishness, and we camp out in the shadow of the valley of death. Why? Well, let me explain it this way. This may be a little foreign to some people nowadays. I understand. Bear with me. I'll give you a bit of a history lesson. But do, do you remember before there was GPS on your phone? You, like, remember before you could say, hey, Siri, get me directions to the bank. And up would, up would pop the turn-by-turn -turn directions there. Do you remember anything before that, right? Because here's the thing. There was a time before that. And before there was that, you actually had to use one of these bad boys. Do, do you remember what these are? Guys, these are called, these are called maps. Okay, maps. And, and these broke up so many relationships in the world because of this, because you would get a map out and then you would try to navigate yourself and then by the end of it you broke up because you just were so fed up with each other, right? There was map. Or there was, there was another thing, that it, it was a crazy thing, it was called like map quest and you would print off turn by turn directions and then you would give it to the passenger and they would tell you where to go, right? Do you remember all of these? Like as, as good as those were, there was actually something better though. And it was two words that made you feel so secure. It's so safe and so warm and fuzzy. It wasn't even funny. funny. And it, it was this. It was when you heard these two words from your buddy. And your buddy would say, follow me. Right, follow me. And, and both of you would hop in your cars. And then you would literally follow each other to the destination that you were trying to go. And then, and then tell me this isn't true. Tell me that you wouldn't hug as tight as you could to his bumper. Because you didn't want to lose them or get lost. Am I right? So what would you do? You would tailgate on the backside of them like crazy. You were glued to them. Why? Because you wanted to make sure when they made a left turn that you saw their signal. That if they changed lanes, that you would change lanes with them. And, and of course, here's a real test. Guys, you know this is true. Don't lie. That when you got to that, that stoplight and started to turn yellow and was going to turn red, you had to make a decision. And what would you do? You would, boom, you'd speed up. That's right. Sorry, all you law enforcement people out there, but y'all did too. I know it. You'd speed up because you didn't want to lose them. You had to follow them to get to the destination. The same thing is true of leadership. If we're following someone, we are in essence looking at the back of them. We are trusting their navigation, their decision making. So what would cause someone to peel off the path and go their own way? In other words, why do we stop following Jesus even though we know what direction he's taking us on? There are so many reasons that we could fill books upon books upon books. In fact, there's not enough books in the world to be able to, to contain all the excuses we've created. But, but let's just consider a few of them. And, and think about it kind of in the same idea of following someone. Let's just consider a few here, why we would peel off. And the first is, is that, well, the pace is too fast, we say. Jesus, you're going too fast. I don't know if I can do all these things really, really fast. Like, it's just, it's too fast. So I'm just going to stop and I'll make catch up with you later. It's too fast. Second thing we say is that we don't like the route we're taking. We're saying, oh, okay, Jesus, I'll follow you. But whoa, 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 time out, time out. We're going to go right. I really want to go left. It really looks way better over there. So Jesus, uh, you, you, good luck over there. Or the other thing we'll do is that we will, we'll change our mind about the destination. You will say, oh yeah, I want, I want heaven. I want eternal life. I want to follow you. Yeah, but... Oh, wait, uh, she's pretty cute. Oh, that job, oh, that's got some success. I, I don't know, I, those destinations look a little bit better, Jesus, so I think I'll, I'll go off for those. Or, or what about this? We feel that the sacrifice is too great. We say, whoa, Jesus, wait, whoa, 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 time out, Jesus. You wanted me to do what with my money? Wait, you don't want me to sleep with who before I'm married? Wait, time out, like, there's a way that I, whoa, time, the, whoa, 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 the sacrifice is too great, we say. Or the last thing is, is we, we, we lose sight of the leader. We just kind of, 
lag back. We're like, oh, Jesus, you're, you're too far away. Uh, uh, it's too far. I'll just give up, right? All of these, so many more, are reasons why we stop following. And, and we could trace all of these reasons and all the other ones back to one word, fear. They are whispers by Satan to distract us and destroy us. But here's what's awesome about our God. He's patient. He's willing to wait for us. He knows that we will get distracted on the side excursions of sin. And as much as it pains him to see us go off that path, he is gracious and loving to wait for us while we wander away. But God's hope is that we won't stray from the path. And the image that has been ingrained in my mind to show this is found in the book of Isaiah. And there we read how this prophet describes how this all-encompassing way of looking at God that you just marvel when you hear what he says. Look in verses 10 through 11 of chapter 40. Isaiah says, See, the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. What a magnificent image of God. That God is sovereign. That God is mighty. That God is powerful. He's all those things. But yet in the very same breath, he says that he, he gathers, that he carries, that he gently leads. We have to be careful that we have the right vision of God. If, if, our, if we weight our view of, of, of God too far on either side, we'll miss out on his fullness. What I mean is that if, if God is all-powerful but also unmerciful, then he is unapproachable. But, but if God has, has, is, is all mercy but yet is, has, is unjust, then he is unhelpful. So in order to follow fully, we must have a right, relevant, holistic view of God. Of this God that we're asking to lead us. And it only happens when we know him. When we stay close to him. We trust the path that he has for us. But most importantly, we must choose to willingly follow him. Which is why I want you to think of this one idea more than anything else today. This one idea is that God leads... He never drags. God is not interested in dragging us through the gates of heaven when this life is over. He'll never do it. But he also will not swing wide those gates to let all come in regardless of whether they believe in him or not. He'll never do that either. We are given this life to choose what we will do when it comes to our eternity. Which is why we have to choose the right leader the right voice, choose to live and choose to follow. Our choice is of eternal significance. And listen, God knows it's not easy. Jesus was very clear about how important it was to follow him because of the ask that he was making. Uh, Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 7. He says, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. Only a few find it. It's not hard to see why people choose not to follow Jesus in this life. The road that Jesus is not on is wide, it is well paved, has no speed limit whatsoever. In fact, the faster that you and I go on it, the more Satan likes it because he knows that the faster that we go, the harder it will be to stop. And when we do try to stop, it's going to cause the greatest damage. But the path Jesus wants to lead, on, lead us on takes time. It can be slow going. It, it will have difficult things to climb over. You will have to trust the leader to know where you're going. But at the end of Jesus' path is life, and at the end of the other road is death. But the choice is ours. God leads. He never drags. So what does this all mean? Gates and paths, shepherds and sheep, follow and lead. They, 
they all point to the same thing. They all point to the very same question. And this is the question. Is Jesus who he said he is? Is Jesus who he said he is? Is is he the son of God sent to rescue us from our sins? Is, Is faith in him by grace alone the only way to salvation? Is the road that he wants us on the only way to eternal life? And if those are all true, then you will follow him. Because God leads. He never drags. The simplicity of that point and the complexity of that decision will determine the outcome of this life and for the next life for all of us. We are free to choose. But only one way will lead us to eternal life. Only one way will lead us to an eternity worth being led into. So my friends, I ask you right now, do you know who's leading you? Do do, do you know who you're following? And if you're following yourself or you're following this world or you're following someone else, they're leading you to a path of destruction. And the proof is in your life. Look around. But inside you is a longing, a different GPS, a God positioning system, if you will, asking for a different route. And that route is found true north in Jesus Christ. He's not going to drag you. He wants to lead you. So right now in this moment, as we prepare our hearts for communion, I ask you, Are you willing to let Jesus lead you? And the reason that we can be confident in that is that Jesus was led to somewhere that we should have went. Jesus was led to the cross to die for your sins and my sins. And he chose that. As he looked down on humanity, Jesus could have chose not to enter in and we could have, des- we could have gotten the, the death that we deserve because of our sin. But Jesus says, I can't bear to be without them. And so he chooses to leave the perfection of heaven for the imperfection of earth. That he lives a perfect life. That he dies a death on a cross, humiliated for you and I. He goes into a tomb that was meant for you and I. He defeats death that was meant for you and I. He ascends to heaven to prepare a place for you and I. He does all of that because he chose to do it because he loves us. And what he asks for in return is that we ask him to lead us, that we would follow him, to discover him, yes, but to follow him fully. If you have never made a decision to follow Jesus, I'm going to lead you in a prayer to be able to do that as we prepare our hearts for communion to give our life over to him so that we can be led to an eternal life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you exhausted. We come to you fatigued and tired. We come to you and ask, God, that you and you alone would speak to that empty part inside us. I pray right now, Father, that on the other side of these lenses, that today you would reach into homes and coffee shops and workplaces and living rooms and bedrooms, God, that you would speak into this moment. And if there's anyone out there that does not know your son as Lord and Savior, that they're being led in other directions, that today, today, right now, that they would cry out to Jesus and say, Jesus, I'm lost. My sin has taken me away from what I know is right and what I feel right now is missing in my life. I believe right now, Jesus, that you died for my sins in my place, that you resurrected, that you defeated death, that you prepare a place for me in heaven and that through your grace, I can be made free because you are so, so good to me. I want you in my life. I repent of my past. I embrace my future that is found in you. Lead me, Jesus. God, you tell us if anyone claims your son as Lord and Savior, is led by them, that they will be entered into heaven 
but their life is starting anew right now. The old is gone, the new has come. Father, I pray that many, many, many would do that right now. Jesus, save as we remember you through communion. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name.